to the Bantry Bay Pub as we celebrate Ireland, the familiar and the unfamiliar. Now tonight's celebration is not just of the uh, Ireland of St. Patrick's time, but of the real Ireland that begins with the legend of Cahoolan. Now historians will regale you with tales of war, battles, politics, important dates and such. That, however, would not be the whole picture. The whole story is how the Irish fused the mythical with the real to give the Irish a personhood. In 1560, Thomas Campion, an Englishman, had this to say about the Irish. The people are thus inclined. They are religious, frank, amorous, ireful, capable of suffering infinite pains. They are found to be glorious, with many sorcerers and excellent horsemen. Though delighted by wars, they are also great almsgivers and most surpassing in hospitality. They are sharp-witted, lovers of learning, capable of anything they bear their mind to. They are constant in hard times, adventurous, intractable, and kind-hearted. It's the first time in history that someone got it right. <laughs> I ask you kindly to keep this description in mind as we go about tonight's proceedings. Kindest to bear with our attempts at the Irish brogue. Thanks. <laughs> so this is the Bantry Bay Irish Pub in the heart of Times Square. Yes, indeed, it is. More lights would help. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, just before they closed, they had an electric fire. Uh, but not to worry, the work is almost finished. And? Uh, well, most of the tables and chairs are stored in back. Well, at least there's one table and chair. Oh, and looky here! A bar and two bar stools. <laughs> there's a bit more light over here. Let me show you our perspectives. <clears throat> and the prospects don't look that good to me. Well, now, you can't really appreciate what a gem it is in this light. After all, what's an Irish pub without bright lights and patrons? Really? I'm supposed to invest in a bar that... A pub, please. It's not the same as a bar. An Irish pub is... It's special. In a pub that's not a bar. <laughs> I know it's hard to understand. <clears throat> Do you hear music? Well, you always hear music when you're in Ireland. Cute. But well, we're in New York City. Ah, <laughs> uh, but so you see, John, once you step into the Bantry Bay, you are in Ireland. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can get some lights on in here, okay? What the hell is going on here? <laughs> Have you ever heard the story of
gob and stop your whinging. What, what? Who do you think you are? I'm Cahoon, St. Brendan, St. Patrick, St. Bridget, and I have journeyed through history, adapting, warring, placating, cajoling, and shape-shifting to be idle. Unbelievable. Well, now that we've established who you are, uh, why are you here? I'm here to help you better understand Ireland. If you are to buy this book, there are three things which you must learn about the Irish. We have a love of knowledge, a reverence for language, and a belief in the unimaginable forces of life. And how did you manage that, pray tell? How else do you think the Irish declared banshees of leprechauns? Or decided that mankind was king and the earth was queen, resulting in a perfect marriage? Thus we let the irrational survival go rational. You know, I'm knackered dealing with the likes of you. Oh, banshees and, and leprechauns and good old St. Patrick? Jesus, Mary and Joseph, what the hell to go and say that for? You ever heard of me, man, Flat O'Brien? Can't say as I have. He was a great Irish scholar and writer. He defined that the average native English speaker had a vocabulary of 400 words, while the native Irish speaker had a vocabulary of 400,000 words. <laughs> there is scarcely a word in the Irish that is simple or explicit. Some with so many complete a spectrum of graduated ambiguity that each of them can be made to have two directly contrary meanings. So put in pause on that. Ironic usage, poetic license, oxymoron, ethic evasion, Irish bordery, and paddywhackery. And you can understand a fright of the English speaker with his wretched box of 400 vocal beats compared to a really good Irish speaker who can out 400 words in one cosmic grunt. <coughs> Now I understand how the Irish accomplished all those great deeds. They talked everyone to death. I can Leave the man alone, you're attending in some big fear. I might be some music if you please. In Dublin's fair city, where the girls are so pretty, I first met my eyes on sweet Molly Malone. And she pushed her wheel barrows, pushed her for and narrow, crack hackles and muscles and live a live
I think poets ought to do what musicians do. Stand on the corner with a cup on the ground in front of them and read their poems aloud. Did you hear them? Come here for you, have you no soul? I'm a businessman. This Oira stuff is for the tourists. Stuff! Stuff! You don't mean like the poems they get to Kavanaugh? Or the music of the items from men that ditch back to peak civilization? That what you be talking about? Whoa, back off! Now what are we talking about? Do you back off! Are you mental? Open up your mind and listen rather than filling the air with your bladder. Now hush, me, John. Just take a seat. Just listen a bit. <laughs> license premise where, according to Flan, Donnie induced him to consume a large measure of an intoxicating whiskey. Only a few drinks later, however, did Donnie up and grab Flan and start for the door. He had taken an instant dislike to a fella at the end of the bar. A quick look over his shoulder convinced Flan that Donnie was right. Truth be told, he was a right cadaverous man, <laughs> dressed all in black with a face of deathly gray. Outside at the curb in the pitch dark, it took a few moments to find their taxi. Then it was off to another licensed premise on the Enniscary Road. Donnie was out the taxi, dragging Flan by his sleeve. The minute they stopped, inside there were only a few patrons who seemed surprised by Donnie's explosive entrance. His proclamation, however, that he was celebrating a new job was a signal for all to rejoice. That wouldn't you? Donnie pointed to the end of the bar, and there stood the cadaverous man drinking a pint of stout. While Flan downed his drink, Donnie purchased a bottle of whiskey. As they stumbled back out into the dark, 
Donnie argued that they had to put a distance between them and the man. And no amount of talk would change his mind. The next public house they entered was being empty of drinkers. And Donnie was now dealing in his bottle of whiskey and large gulps. As their eyes became accustomed to the dark, Flan could see at once that they were faced with a crisis. There, standing in gloom, was the cadaverous man, as grim and grey as ever. Now, this is the part that Flan always liked best. See, he was going to become the hero of this story. He decided that this was a diabolical adversary who would come like a spectral vision from the tomb on a task of inhuman vengeance against poor Donnie. This is what followed, as Flan himself told me, facing him, Flan said, I don't much like the looks of you. I don't much like the look of your father. I demand to know why you persist in following myself and my friend everywhere we go. I cannot leave until you go home. But why? Because I'm your taxi driver. <laughs> Out of such strange incidents <laughs> occur the patterns of what Flan likes to call the patterns of his life. It's not all you can find at the bottom of your glass. I mean, where's your sense of history? You give out with a story about two idiots when the likes of the minstrel boy is what she should be telling. for the St. Patrick's Day pageant. Well, go on, John. What else do you remember? Uh, I had to memorize a poem by uh, Yeats. He wishes for the clouds of heaven. Had I the heavens embroidered clouds, wrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark clouds, night and light, and the half-light. I would have spread the cloths under your feet, <coughs> but I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. Yates is fine, but my man's Patrick Cavanaugh. 
Aye, there's a man knowing the truth of things. When it comes to women. <clears throat> now I must search till I have found my God. Not in an orphanage. He hides in no humanitarian disguise. A derelict upon a barren bog. But in some fantastically ordinary inn call. Behind the eyes of a well-bred convent girl. Or wrapped in middle-class felicities among the women in the coffee shop. For heavens, the general impulse is content with feeding praise to the good. And all of these that I have known have come to me from women. While men in the poet's tragic light presented, the spirits that his woman caressed me so.
attention. Well, I always pay attention to a pretty woman, such as yourself, me girl. Oh. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Just be a few minutes. No rush. Take your time. I have messages. 